This month marks the official 20th anniversary of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, based off the best-selling book by J.K. Rowling, which was the first in what would become one of the most successful movie franchises of all time. But even with the major success of the book, the movie itself still had to be sold to general audiences, so today we're going to explore what it took to get people hyped for Harry Potter. So let's get into it. Hello friends and welcome back to the Brock Up side and to the first episode of History of Hype where we learn how butts got in seats for our favorite movies and you know it takes a lot of work to promote a movie like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone through posters, trailers, toys and even video games. But before we dive into all of that let's just take a step back for a moment to back when Harry Potter was just words on a page. June 1997 Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or Philosopher's Stone if you want to get technical, was released to store shelves and it sold like a bunch of copies. Then in 1999, Warner Brothers bought the rights to the series with the intention of obviously making a movie out of it. Who knew? With the movie on its way, Warner Brothers first released a line of merchandise based on the book. This included calendars, collectible figurines, and board games which had like a million different pieces and were way more complicated than it's worth. This is known to Harry Potter fans as book merch. Trust me, this will be important later. December 2000. The first teaser poster for the movie was released, showcasing an owl carrying Harry's Hogwarts acceptance letter. I gotta say though, this owl is a very threatening presence to it. Hey look, the mail's here! Three months after that, the first teaser trailer was released, which was a simple montage of clips, pretty standard teaser stuff, only with another owl coming straight for me. Slam nowhere. Eventually, another trailer and posters were released, with the main one-sheet poster being quite different depending on if your little corner of the world called the movie Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone. One of these is vastly superior to the other in my opinion, but I'm not going to tell you which one so you can go out and form your own opinion and think for yourself. Naturally, this is when the movie merch and tie-ins would start, but some strict rules had to be followed, mainly with Coca-Cola. The rule for the movie's tie-in promotions was simple. Put the audience into Harry's world, not Harry into our world. It's okay to put the Harry Potter logo on Coke cans, but you sure as hell won't see any of the characters doing this. Just for the taste of it, Diet Coke. In fact, the Coca-Cola company ended up donating millions of dollars worth of books to schools as part of their marketing deal. They even ran a contest where one lucky winner would receive a screening of the movie plus a school library. Yeah, you guys gotta leave. Remember what I said earlier about book merch? Well, building up to the movie itself, the movie merch was kinda similar in that images from the movie itself were barely used to try to make the hype feel a little more natural and similar to the book. After the movie came out, however, all bets were off. This looks nothing like Daniel Radcliffe. This looks everything like Daniel Radcliffe. And just like with any other major movie comes the toys, including a line of action figures such as this really cool Harry Potter I've got here, as well as this- Oh! Then came the Lego sets. These things are awesome. Eleven sets based on the movie were released, ranging from really simple dioramas, like the Sorting Hat, to a full-on Hogwarts castle. It even got a PC game. Sadly, I don't have any sets to show you in person, cause shit's expensive! But I do have this little original Harry Potter minifigure, so that counts, right? The LEGO Harry Potter series was so popular it's still continuing today, and is one of the best-selling LEGO themes of all time. Three days before Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was released in theaters, we got games. As in more than one for the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and the PS1. These are essentially the same game, only with major graphical differences. We're gonna take a quick look at the PS1 version because it's the only one I have. In this game, you basically explore Hogwarts Castle, unlocking secrets, attending classes, and collecting beans. The game is mostly puzzle-based, where you use spells to figure out different areas, which somehow includes making snails blow up. Get to the charms class before the timer runs out. Who the f- Who the f 
freaking cooks. Ooh. My favorite part of the game by far is the Draco Malfoy boss battle where you just throw firecrackers at each other and then Crab and Goyle are in the background like, yeah, we're gonna get you. Let me teach you about wizard crackers. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you call me? Not to mention, this game features the greatest sex icon in gaming history, PS1 Hagrid. There would also be versions of this game released for Xbox, PS2, and GameCube two years later. Fun fact, the Xbox version is one of the first games I ever owned as a kid, and hearing some of the same music in the PS1 version brought back some good memories of playing that game. If I had to recommend one, it would definitely be this version because it follows the movie much closer, has far superior graphics, a more logical tutorial level, and this wonderful gem of a moment. A wizard card! A WIZARD CARD! I actually made this reference back in 2018 for my Crimes of Grindelwald review, and nobody got it. Nobody watched it either. Finally, all this hype would come together on November 16th, 2001, when the movie would finally be released to the public. It brought in $90 million on its opening weekend and would go on to make over $974 million worldwide, becoming the number one movie of 2001, beating out both Shrek and Monsters, Inc. Now, personally, I have rather vague memories of watching the movie in the theater back in 2001 because I was pretty young, but there are still some key moments from that experience that still stick out to me, like watching Dudley fall into the snake enclosure for the first time, or that scene in the bathroom with the troll which scared the poop out of me as a kid. It was of course brought to DVD later on with this sexy digibook design, this is the pinnacle of early DVDs where they put so much effort into the menus with elaborate animations and tried to make it as interactive as humanly possible. The bonus features let you explore the world of the movie with the arrow keys on your remote, and this kind of stuff I honestly miss on current physical media releases. Chances are, if you owned DVDs in the early 2000s, you had this in your collection. While compared to some members of my own family that practically breathe this franchise, I still really love Harry Potter, and getting to look back and see what it took to make the first movie so successful just brought back a lot of memories for me, whether it be talking about the posters, the trailers, or even the video game, and I think that just goes to show that a movie can be special outside of the movie itself. So if you want to see some more videos from me, you can check out this one right over here, or if you want to see what YouTube recommends you watch from me next, you can check out that video right down there, and of course subscribe if you live talking by movies, and we'll see you on the break of CI.